Now we, we let's let's pick it up and get into your team maple, which which you serve for all your playing career. Yeah. And tell me how that started and, and take me through that. Well, it started when I was at Fatima College. Mm -hmm. And Fatima College usually would use one of the, the national players to come in and coach. We had quite a few of them. Hugh Seeley was one of them. Mm -hmm. The famous goalkeeper, they used to call him the Black Panther. And he, um, he coached Maple for part of the time. Alan Joseph coached us for a part of the time. As a matter of fact, Lance Murray mm -hmm. coached us after Hugh Seeley and then Alan Joseph. But Hugh Seeley always remained. He paid me visits at home when I was 15, 16, talking to my parents um, about joining Maple. In other words, he was, he was recruiting me for about three years, right? So when the time came and I was going out to school, uh, Alan Joseph was the one who was coaching at the time. Mm -hmm. and this was done very smart. Maple Malvern together were playing against the rest of Trinidad in the Grand Savannah for you know, as an opening of, and I got selected in the Maple Malvern team. Alan was the captain. You had people like Squeaky Hines and mm -hmm. Phil Douglin, mm -hmm. and oh, a whole lot of them, Conrad Braffitt and Noel Wynn, one of the 13 boys. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all in this team. I was like scared, but I got half of the game into the team, and every time, I never forget this, every time I got the ball and did something that Alan Joseph thought was good, he says, this is not the last time you're going to see him here. And he keeps saying this all the time. And every time I did something, he'd pat me on the back and, and sort of driving me in, not driving me, but making me feel that, you know, I'm wanted in this. Right. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the season, I was in the North team um, playing against South. Right. And from there, it just built and, and built, started to get better. Um, incidentally, I had the exposure because I played in the Fatima's first ever intercultural team at the age of 14 going into 15. Right. I played at 15 going into 16, 16 going into 17, and that was it. Right. So therefore, I, we had to play. We didn't play in a, in a college's league. We had to play against Maple and Malvern and Notre Dame. We, right. we were second division, but we were playing the knockouts, the FA Trophy and the League Cups, whatever. Right. So I had the exposure, and I, I was sort of growing with it. I also had a little bit more advancement in, in the business of cricket because in those days, you either six months for cricket, six months for football. If you're not playing one of them, it means that you're doing nothing, nothing. for six months. Right. I couldn't afford the luxury. I just love both of them. And I was playing and playing and playing. And all of a sudden, I was called into this, the cricket team to trials against England in 1954. And I'm saying, I don't, know, I, I don't know that I want this. It was a matting wicket, and these guys were big. There was a guy out of, of, of Point 14 called Buxton Peters. He was mm -hmm. as huge as they come. And even in the nets, I used to be a little bit scared. Jeffrey Stolmeyer used to come, no, you don't need to be afraid. He said, don't care what the size is, the ball's got to come in the same size to you. So just do, you know, that sort of thing. How, you're afraid not to get picked? Yeah. I was praying not to get picked, but they were top class players, Naira Nasgrali, Andy Gantum, they were. So I knew that Joey Karu and myself, they were only there to have us as, you know, to, to help us on, that sort right. of thing. But that's when I got exposed to cricket. And in 55, they played, they, they played an under 20, we, under 20 team played against the Combined Islands. They, that was my first entry into international cricket. A lot of people don't know that you represent the country at cricket and football. Actually, I played, I played um, cricket longer than I played football. football. I started in, in 55 with cricket, as I said to you. Went right through to 1972. And um, in it, I played three seasons in England with the International Cavaliers. So my yeah. cricket career was pretty long. I stopped football because it was yeah. told to me that if you don't play, they say that you're not making the West Indies cricket team because you're playing too much football. So I dropped football in 69 so you can pick up the, to be able, and I got some runs. I got 100 against Guyana, and I got 60 against Barbados, 56 against Guyana, and I still didn't get picked. And the, the, the late Larry Constantine was in Trinidad at the time, and he came to me, he said, son, don't be disappointed. 
I'll get you to England. I'll get you to be a professional cricketer. That's how I became a professional cricketer in England that same year. And uh, when I got to England, uh, I, was, I became a little bit more recognized. And, and when I came back home, which was the better part, when I was playing for Trinidad before, we used to get $5 a day. Right. And they would clean our <coughs> pants and our shirt. That's it. When I came back from England, I was getting $300 a match. I mean, I was like in heaven. Yeah. Because this was a, a 300% increase, increase in, right. in, in this, you know. And then I, I started to treat professionalism a little bit more than I had done before. I really didn't love cricket. They said that I was naturally talented and I played it. A lot of times, and this is in hindsight and by in regret, a lot of times I got out because I felt that, hey, but you were bullying me for a long time, I'm 50 something. You're not supposed to get me out. And then is when I got out right. because I, I sort of went overboard with playing shots. And, right. and if you look at my scores, you'd see a bunch of 50s, but four centuries. You know, and, and that tells me the story. And I always said, I was not good enough. It wasn't a question of not as good as the others, but I was not good enough to think along the lines of being a Simonist to score 200. Right. And when I played against them, and these guys were scoring 172 and want to break the bat when they get out. And I was at 56 and, and happy walking out that I got 50. Right. You know, it made a tremendous difference to my life. Right. And, but in football, I was like you. I want to be good every day. Right. As a matter of fact, I was a little, there was some discussion with Malvo and Maple and, and about the selection. And, and um, Phil Douglin came and he pat me on the back one day and said, you always getting picked in the, in the national team. He was a selector. Eh? And I turned to him, I said, you know what? You all will have to drop me for playing good. I said, you want to drop me? Drop me for playing good. And he laughed and I laughed and we went away with it. But I, he didn't know that I was serious. When I'm going to play football, it's a different bag entirely. Um, my wife used to say, you're very uncomfortable. I say, you're right. I'm nervous. I'm nervous, but I'm going to it. But cricket was a little bit different. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I have to put it down to the, 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 my dedication to the game of football. Mm -hmm. And this started, this started even more when I was in England and, uh, for six months under an English coach. You know, but it has been interesting on both sides of the coin. Well, it must have been, you came back to football because I remember when yeah. I joined the service in, 70, yeah. in the 70s. And we played Maple in one of the cup finals. The, um, the Amstel Cup. Amstel Cup. <laughs> and I look at the sideline and the <laughs> Alvin Colin is rubbing down with whatever. We're getting ready to come on the field and I'm like, not gonna make a difference, <laughs> and you did. Yeah. You, you remember that game? Of you course, that I remember game? that game. The the thing about it is that um, I <laughs> knew that the worth of you guys because you had you had yourself. You have an him as well. You had Ken you had the, Morin. Ken Morin. Yeah. You all had a fantastic team. Right. And we were going goalless, and this crowd was huge. Right. And we got a free kick free outside kick. the box, and Arnim was the man on the outside. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, no, he can't, he can't do anything about this. Don't worry about it. It was a short guy called Clyde. What's his name? Ooh. The goalkeeper from? Oh, Battle George. Ba Battle George. Yeah. And um, they all set it up and everything. And I hit this ball and it just swooped around and went into the net and Arnim held his hand yeah. and, and George stood up and he wanted to find out what was going on and, you know, and it, it, it dawned on me then that, you know, did you stop playing football too early? But it wasn't that I stopped playing football too early. I went into coaching. Right. <clears throat> when I was playing as a, in England, I did three coaching courses. I mm -hmm. got the English A license. I came back, coached St. Mary's College, and beat all you guys from uh, that year mm -hmm. with Alvin Henderson and Neil Williams and... Oh, yeah, and well, and that. Were, college, but right? yeah, that was yeah. a beautiful, beautiful yeah. team down there. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we won that league. And then I came to Maple. And I was player coach at Maple. That's, that's when we that, came that, up, yeah. Yeah, that came up. But 
What you didn't know is that I couldn't last more than the 20 minutes I played. Well, that's why they kept you off the field for a little while and bring you off. If I, if I could have started, I, I yeah. just couldn't last. Right. You know, but it was enjoyable. <laughs> Great experience. That was for me, too, because I, I never... I saw you play before in early earlier years in South against yeah. Shell and, and stuff, yeah. but after that, I didn't see for a while, and, and then, no, that was an experience for me. Yeah. I'm like, I can't do nothing. I haven't covered on it. Yeah. Boom, one nothing. Yeah. And went away with our, our trophy. Yes. Because yes. we were because we thought we would the win. winner would play for the FA trophy. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It's the Amstel Bear was the, the the winner would play for the FA trophy against somebody else. This yeah, was right, between so. um your league and Port of Spain League and right. SFL. Right. Those who won that one would play the other team for the FA trophy. Yeah, that was that was that was an experience that yeah, I never Yeah, but I forgot. enjoyed you more because of that because yeah. um I didn't have to play against you. <laughs> you know, and I um, had the opportunity of traveling with you guys out to Suriname right. and then out to French Guiana as well another right. time. As a matter of fact, we were sitting on the flight. Um Yeah, we spoke on the flight. and, and spoke a little bit because, you know, um I was I saw a game before and somebody was kicking the daylights out to you and you sort of uh, started to get the, the desire to to and I said, listen, you've got a lot of those kicks to get. Right. I said, I've yeah. gotten them all my life. I said, you're young. And, you know, um, but because I, I recognize your potential. And mm -hmm. I followed the game, as you realize. I, I went straight from this into radio broadcasting, into coaching. Um, I got a license that I could have coached in England if I wanted, because it was the A license. And I just went on. Did you recruit um, Kevin Verdi? For That's the correct. national team? That's correct, England? because he was my tutor. Uh -huh. He was my tutor for the prelim badge and the, the intermediary badge. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he was the one who said, go and get the... He said, because if you get a, 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 a certificate from England, you can work in England. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it and I, I went to get it. But Kevin was... I thought he was a good teacher. He was a very good teacher. And I felt that whoever would have gotten the job... And Edgar was the one who would have been there. There must have been something to learn. And the English had, to, in my mind, and I still do believe, the greatest formula for coaching is in England. But they're not creative. They're not, they're stereotype. You watch the English team and they got certain similarities, unless they got seven or eight outsiders. But they bear a certain degree of similarity in their work. Mm -hmm. And um, they were quick to say that... Um, or you don't want to dri dribble in, we could do it out it. So long as we pass the ball well and we go for the passes, get into the space, that was, that was solid information. Mm -hmm. But when you mix it with skill, it's three times better. Mm -hmm. Because then I could lessen the opposing team by taking on two guys. Exactly. You know, they couldn't do that. They, they had the Jimmy Greaves and they had all these players who were good runners of the ball, taking half chances, scoring goals. Mm -hmm. But after the 66 World Cup, they didn't win anything. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I'm sure somebody must have told you um, this before, but when I first saw Revelino um, playing with him in Seattle, Washington, when Team America played Brazil, well, I was playing against them. Yeah. I saw Alvin Conley on the field with the way he was built, the way he looked, the way he played. Did anybody ever tell you that you look exactly? Listen, Carlton Franco, up to two years ago, he said, when all of these guys talking about swerve kick and this, that, and the other, he said, we had a Revelino right in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. He said, you all didn't recognize him half as much as you recognized Revelino. Right. Now, I happened to look at him play, and I, th well, for his left foot alone and the things that he did with it, it was amazing. Right. And everybody used to come up with, you know, you used to do it as good as this guy. I said, listen, hold on. Let me appreciate this guy a lot because I really, and I felt good about the fact that I had the opportunity a few years afterwards to meet him. Mm -hmm. And yes, he was one of, one of my favorite players. Unbelievable. I mean, I mean, I would say everything, everything, even how he was built and how he played. And I was like, wow, this is Alvin Coney who I'm playing against. Uh, let's look at him again. Yeah, he, he, he was a tremendous player. He, he was, was, he was yeah. a tremendous player. So anyhow, so Brazil has the Pelé and the Revelino, and we have our Alvin Cornejo. Well, you know, we have our Steve David too. Don't you yeah. ever forget that. No, no, no. Uh, I, uh, let, me, let me tell you this. 
I went to Los Angeles uh -huh. uh, many, many years ago. That time you were playing out there with Georgie Best. And I went to get something in a sports shop. And two guys were talking. They were, you know the Americans, they talk louder than everybody else. So they're talking and they were arguing about Steve David and, and Georgie Best. And they were talking and this one, look at Georgie there, say, Steve David, you saw the game, so and so, and they're talking. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the head, the supervisor, he says, listen, don't worry those guys. He said, they both like Steve David. He said, they're just trying to divide for an argument. He said, because they're here all the time and all they keep talking about is Steve David. I said, tell you something, I would have talked about him too. He came from my country. He said, your country? I said, yeah, he came from my country. He said, by God, where the hell did he get all that skill? I said, we teach that to everybody. Don't worry about it. But he was, he was elated over you as well. So you, you are not out of the picture, as I keep saying all the time to people. If we had a Steve David, if we had a Bobby Sukram, we would have had a team. We would have had people who would take their half chances and get the ball in the net. Okay, since you're bigging up all the players, what about Maple players? Like, um, big up some of them that you think that was good, like Bobby. I thought Bobby was amazing. The greatest, one of the greatest forwards amazing. I saw. Best player without the ball, maybe. Kelvin mm -hmm. Barassa would, would match him in that regard. Mm -hmm. Andy Allion was probably the smartest footballer that I have ever played with as uh, a forward. These were all Maple players, right? Yes, Andy mm -hmm. was Andy, Andy was classy. He was he was nonchalant. Mm -hmm. If you saw him walk down the street, you wouldn't think that he can kick a ball out of anywhere. Mm -hmm. But he's smart. We've played, we have, we have done, we used to play outside and I'm inside. And we used to do some combinations and get some goals at good levels. Um, we did it against Mexico in, Pan, in the, the Pan Am games. We did it against Colombia. It happened all over the place. He was just, uh, we were just compatible with each other in that way. Um, I thought Sedley Joseph to be the best leader that I have ever played with. Right. Um, he, and, and this is one of the things uh, I, I was comparing with today's players. When a game changes its strategy from the point of view of the, the coach of the next team, our players do not know how to adjust, adjust because they have no Sedley Joseph to say, hey, listen, this is what these guys are doing. Let's change it. Let's go this way. Mm -hmm. There was no Sedley Joseph in that. Right. The, Sedley Joseph was a master of the art. He was. He didn't have speed. His, his passes were like 90% at all times. The simple passes. Mm -hmm. And he would drive you on in the most polite way. You'd swear he was a priest begging you to play. But he would get you to play. So there, there, there were some good players. Dick Rodriguez. I don't know if you remember him. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Tyrone de Labastide. Tyrone de Labastide was the best reader of a game in defense that I have seen. Selvin Moren was another one. Mm -hmm. Those guys were top of the line. It's a pity we did not have a lot of television in those days where the public could have seen the mastery of some of these guys because they would, Tyrone de Labastide was short. He would get up higher than almost everybody. Mm -hmm. His timing of the pass, the true passes were excellent. He would call on his defense to reorganize quickly. These are the things that made Trinidad and Tobago an excellent football team. An excellent football team. We didn't play Grenada. We played Chelsea, Wolverhampton, mm -hmm. Arsenal, Tottenham Hotspurs. We played those teams. We played the, the America Football Club of Brazil, the Brazil under 23 team. Those were our internationals. So if we didn't show there, we would be embarrassed. We would be embarrassed. Nobody ever beat us seven nothing or nothing to that effect. We'd be right back after the show. Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited offers solutions to your immediate and future potential problem areas by providing you with a qualified team of safety consultants Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited, building a reputation on quality and value since 1999. Located 23 Todd Street, San Fernando, Trinidad. Phone 868-657-1534. 
or 868-788-6955. Worldwide Safety at Yahoo.com. Well, welcome viewers to Field of Dreams and Axe Television Network. My name is Steve David and I'm your host. And uh, again, last week we were talking to Warren, the great Archibald, and this week we're going to continue with part two it, of... It, it was in the, in, 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 in the year that I went there as a schoolboy. They get to know me because I usually were watching the older folks from, from, from my national team perform. I was, it was a learning experience. So I had the opportunity, like I told you, don't allow a man to go on the field. Alvin was the left winger, the striker, what now you call strikers. And he was, was performing, but he was getting a bit tired. So Jerry Brown and I was on the bench with the coach. And he's saying, come on, Conrad, man. Alvin is tired. Look, you have a striker here. You have the boy, he scored in, went to Barbados before that, and I scored a hat-trick or four goals. Because I remember playing against some national team. And you see, I always equipped. I was equipped with about uh, studs and rubbers. So I was playing in my rubbers. I scored one. Rain started to fall. I switched gears. I'm learning. You understand? From Wuta, I switched gears. And I had four. So I had five for Trinidad. Then they took me off. Now in Haiti, I was on the bench. No problem. I have my tools. I know what I could do. So... I sat on the bench. I got a break, like I tell you. Don't allow someone to go on. I got a break. I went on. And it was history. You understand what I'm saying? That's when they brought off your, your brother. You and scored three goals. Man, it was history. There was, everybody was, Ashishi, Ashishi, Achibala, 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 Ashishi, Ashishi. Who is this schoolboy? Who is this kid? And that's when it started. I went on from there. Every you, even even when we went back for the World Cup preliminary, you remember the World Cup preliminaries, and we go in Dong Tong and we go into different places. And I telling you, you see, the people were saying, "How come could you play good football, and you always happy? You never sad." Because I taught them, listen, win or lose, we didn't come here to lose. They did not give us a chance. In Trinidad and Tobago, they did not even give us a chance. He will tell you. They did not give us a break because we was training down in, you know, down there. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a game. And the guys said, where are you going? He, where are you going here, T4? Where well, you can't win nothing? But I'm a positive person. I am not defeated before I play. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Football is 90 minutes. On the field. So on the field. So no, I, used, I, I used to raise the guys' spirit and don't study them and leave them alone. So when we leave here, we had no support group, you know, other than the players and the managers and the coaches and people who really love us. You understand what I'm saying? So when we went to Haiti, I told them, you come here to do a job. Now remember, they never play professional ball. Now you are a professional, you leave your country. You see, they don't understand it. Amateurism is at home. When you leave your country, you become a professional boy. Although you're not getting paid, you have to think and act alike. So we went in a mode. People say, but why are you all partying? It was not a party. You understand what I'm saying? It was a frame of mind that we get in as Trinidadians. And that would put us at peace and you understand, relaxing mode. So it's pan and pan up, pan up, chop, chop, chop. People say, ah, Trinidad, pabo, pabo, pabo. Eh? Uh -huh. I say, don't study them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But we were going to the World Cup if that goal didn't score the first goal. You understand what I'm saying? It wasn't, none of these kids underestimated anybody. But the, 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 the way I spoke to them and the way that we trained, we knew no one was going to beat us. No one was going to beat us. The frame of mind that we were in. I do have a question for Hachi, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you motivated so many players over the years. And then you go into, you know, the U.S. system. Were you able to take 
what you did for the players in Trinidad, then take them through the CONCACAF or the Caribbean region. Were you able to do that now at the NASL level? Because you left the NASL as one of the greatest players to pass through the American football system or revolution, whatever we want to call it. You're basically moving from a smaller country mm. now into a bigger country. Mm. How did you have that influence on the Americans as well? Well, it started in Florida. That was uh, a preseason. And like I tell you, when you know to play football, you know to play football. Football is international and it's one ball. Whatever you know, you put it into practice. You come up against guys that is more skilled than you. You match skills with them. So when I went to, 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 to Florida and I had my first game, no one, no one knew me. They ne ne I don't know what a professional league was, but I knew what my capabilities were. I don't care if I played in England or whatever. So my first game... I scored six goals. <laughs> and the guys never saw me from the team that we played. Who is this little guy? Who is this guy? No one knew about me. And it transpired right through my career. I have no respect. I respect everybody. But I have no respect on that football field. I have none whatsoever. I don't care where you're from. <laughs> I think, I think Narada wanted to know if you, just like how you... You talk to me all the time and make sure that I did the right thing. Did you do that to players from England or Australia or whoever was in that same league with you? No, okay. I didn't do that because it was a learning experience. I was a rookie. So I'm learning from different players like uh, England. You understand what I'm saying? Now I'm a professional ball player. Czechoslovakia, Russia, Germany. You know what I mean? Uh, South America, different players. So I'm incorporating everything that I'm seeing okay. and making one block in my mind. You understand? I'm forming my own nucleus in my mind what to do when I reach different situations. Well, to, and, and to, to, to continue on that path is we had you, myself, and Sellers in Miami. Mm-hmm. Even though we're playing for the Miami Toros, we're still playing for, we want our three, because we're Trinidadians, Trinidad to be on the field. There you go. So we're rooting for each other. Each other. And we, we developing each other as much as we can, even though sometimes we pass on information to others, but not as much as ourselves. Yes, because we, were, we, we know right. somewhere along the line we had to come back and represent, represent Trinidad. Right. So we were forming a, you know, uh, a, a, a bond, bond. Between us, yes. you understand what I mean? A plain bond between us. And, and there's always competition within the ranks. Like I always said to them is, we don't cheat when we practice. And, and, and I learned that from you too, eh? you, you go out and when you work by yourself, you work even harder. 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 Because you always feel like you're cheating yourself yes. because you don't have other competition. That's why we had no light life. Right. <laughs> so the coach says do 10 push-ups. You do 15. Do Exactly, we do a little bit more. Yeah, and and uh, and and again to part that knowledge to others for me is very difficult because I don't think they get into the mindset that yeah. that you brought us to, and maybe you are a better teacher than I am at that. But that's what, how I learned. Yeah, to to go that way. Now the. Us growing up, we had the Doyle Griffith, the Delba Chala, the Roy Hackett, and the mm -hmm. guys who supported our venture mm -hmm. to develop us. I always feel that we dropped the ball in developing the ones coming behind. And the reason I say that is because we migrate, even though we had others who didn't pick up the ball. You know, and, and I didn't need to call names, but there's others who who did not migrate who should have done. So point should not be in the state it is in football now. Just because we migrate, we should have other people who was... Well, like I tell you, it, it was coming to a different 
time, the 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 the, the, the system changed, and the frustration stepped in. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Like me, I don't care really. I care about the kids. That's why I went back and worked with the kids. I came on vacation and I went back and worked. You remember, you have, they, they, they help the kids. That is my contribution. And it's not giving back. You understand what I'm saying? That is how I love kids. I like to work with kids. I was a coach at five years old because every kid in the neighborhood, I had a team and they had to play. Okay? You don't play well, I, I drop you. <laughs> I used to end up with a team with five men playing against guys like Leroy team. Any team come and you don't perform, I'll put you to sit down. And I was a kid also. So my aspect of football was high performance. You have to give your best. What If your best is 50, give me 49. And when I started playing, my concentration level, I had to learn as a professional to think, I couldn't even think for 90 minutes. Do you know, you believe that? 90 minutes was total concentration. And I will give you 80. Somewhere along the line, I'm thinking about Trinidad and Tobago, a family member. And I had to learn these things to concentrate on a game for 90 minutes. I reached 80. 80 was good. I could perform in 80. <laughs> so guys don't know that. It have things you have to do. You see, they're scratching their nose. They're thinking about their girlfriend. They're pulling their pants. Take a picture, you'll see. You understand what I'm saying? That is what coaches don't do. Take a picture of your, or your game time and you'll see them. They're wondering. Total concentration is football. All right, let's, let's drill him and let him tell yeah. us what we should do, I think, well, okay. what this country needs to, to, to move the train forward because we, we, we have, we're struggling. And what do you think in your mind that some of the things that we need to do in this country to improve? And well, improve I'll tell you home. what, right? A lot of people, a lot of coaches just have a name coach. But coaching comes beyond the system are coaching like talking to kids on the street you see them having bad behavior that is coaching they are falling into different categories you understand from playing on the floor well oh i don't play already i don't need that this is my time now no discipline drinking you could have fun without deteriorating your body because I need you for 90 minutes. I need you for Trinidad and Tobago. You don't have things. You have to be in a, in a, in a guideline. You understand what I'm saying? Right. You have to be in a guideline. You eat right. You, don't, you, 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 you sleep right because when I was playing, if I, it worried me to pass 12 o'clock. I feel I would not perform at the highest level. If I don't eat right, you understand what I'm saying? It, 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 I'm frustrated. I would not perform at the highest level. You have to teach the kids. They're not doing that. They're not, these are things that they, they could. Well, uh, it's total respect. It's respect, you know, for the game. Some guys feel they, oh, I have talent. I could jump on there and yeah, yeah, but when you reach real talent, what are you going to do? You're going to embarrass yourself because Trinidad is going to lose 6 nothing. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, you play, you represent Trinidad and Tobago on your chest. But that's not Trinidad and you ain't Trinidad and Tobago. You lost 6 nothing. That feeling I don't like. I don't like losing. You understand? And if you have 11 men who don't like losing, they're going to concentrate on what the game is about. Your coach is just your coach, but you are the player. You know a coach don't have to tell you nothing on the soccer field. You could just sit down right there and watch you. Exactly. Viewers will be right back after this short break. Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited offers solutions to your immediate and future potential problem areas by providing you with a qualified team of safety consultants Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited, building a reputation on quality and value since 1999. 
Located 23 Todd Street, San Fernando, Trinidad. Phone 868-657-1534 or 868-788-6955. Worldwide safety at yahoo.com. I, I know viewers, we've heard of them, we've seen them, but we don't really know them. And let's me take a minute to introduce Marvin Andrews. Marvin, welcome to the set. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Thank you all for inviting me here. And you know, it's always a pleasure once I'm back home, you know, to be part of the show. Thank you for being here, Marvin. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. And, and Dennis Lawrence, Dennis, you have a goal that rings through the world, and it will continue <laughs> to ring for the rest of your life. Um, I'm so glad to have you. Welcome to the set. Steve, thank you for having me. For me, you know, as I said, when I came from San Juan Senior Comprehensive, mm -hmm. I was 17 years of age. Um, then there was a screening for the national under 20, or, or under 18, under 18 tournament, which was in Puerto Rico. Um, Mr. Keith Locloid was the manager at that time. Um, and this was the, the tournament we were preparing for, for Trinidad and Tobago to represent, you know, at the national under 18, you know, tournament in Puerto Rico at that time. So I just came out from school. Obviously, um, we were there were over I think a hundred players was screening at that time in um, Saint Augustine, and obviously you know you had to boil it down to a squad of 18. And as I said, thankfully by God's grace, I've I, I made that final 18, and that that was the first time I was you know I represent Trinidad and Tobago, you know at, at, at the under 18 at level. Under 18 level. What about the top level? At the top level, um, I actually. Um, there was a World Cup qualifier, I think was for the 19, 19 what, probably 94 World Cup. I think it was the 1994 World Cup. I made my debut against America and I came on for Tony Roger in the National, in the national Stadium. Okay, that sure. is when I actually breaked in into the senior team right. because at that time I was playing for National under 18. I went National under 20, under 23. And I was training on no one again with the senior team, but I was never selected to play. And at that time, obviously, I was part of the squad. I was on the bench. Um, as I said, Tony Roger and all these, um, as he said, you know, Kerry Jamison and most of the players who were on the 89 squad, they were still involved in the right. national team. And we were the, the ones coming up behind them. And I made my, my first senior team debut, was in, uh, I think it's for the 19, you know, 1993. It was for the 1994, I think, uh, okay. World Cup. You know, I came on for um, Mr. Tony Roger. Okay, and Dennis? Um, my first representing national team at a junior level was the National at 23. We were actually in preparation for the Pan American Games. Mm -hmm. And we went to St. Martin. We had a, a, a three nation tournament, which for me was a fantastic experience because we had the opportunities. We played against St. Etienne, and there was a, a St. Martin national team and Trinidad and Tobago. And Senetien had players at the time like Lauren Blanc and, and, and Milosevic and, and John Pierre Papin, so it was an incredible experience. And that was the national under 23. And then with the national senior team, I went straight in into the World Cup qualifying qualification campaign. And that was for the for the 2002 World Cup that was, because that was the manager at the time was Ian Porterfield. So I can always remember I made my debut for the national senior team. It was against the Netherlands Antilles. Um, in that 2002 World Cup qualification campaign. So that was the two times I got introduced into to national football. Right. Um, I guess from that point in time, the, the club football for you guys was starting to get very, I would like to say, I, I'm saying prominent because of the fact that about two years after that, I don't know if you all probably checked, but coincidentally, you all had play of the years at your respective clubs around the 2003, somewhere yeah. around season that time. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the national team playing, now you're basically at the prime to an extent of your playing career. What was the experience for both yourself, Dennis, would have been in Wales yeah. with Wrexham and then Scotland? And I would have another question, which would be, what was it like being a foreign player in those respective leagues? Not necessarily only from the ethnicity side of it, but just being in 
leagues that we don't pr know too well in Trinidad and Tobago, what is the experience in Wales and in Scotland as well? Um, the very first thing for me, what I found when I went to Wales, is that it was it was almost home away from home, because the people in and around the football club and the people in Wales they were really really friendly, so that helped a lot. And then when I joined the club, obviously because of the fact that Carlos and Hector and was there before right. me, so they had prior knowledge of, of 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 our culture and what we were like, and it was a, a totally different experience. But I think what helped me in a way was the fact that I went there and I was a lot older and I had experience from being in the army. So I was I was always prepared to face challenges. And it was strange because when I got there, you get there and you, you're full of adrenaline, you're full of excitement and everything. And I started off at the football club and I was I was like at the top of my game because I left Trinidad, I was at the top of my game. And and for the first month and a half, I was, I was right up there. And then after the month and a half, I hit the brick wall and my performances started to go that way and this, this was only for the club and it was really challenging at the time because that's when you understood, hang on, you're not home here because it's a different sort of criticism, it's a different sort of pressure and you just got introduced to the internet and you know you get there and you get caught up into all the excitement of looking for all the good comments and listening to the good comments and then all of a sudden you get out one negative comment about your performance and then you go, hang on, what's happening here? And it's something that you're not used to. So I think for me, that was the, the biggest challenge that I faced, understanding that there's a different type of pressure when you play for these football clubs, because these football clubs for the fans, it's a passion, it's their football club, it's, it, it means a lot to them. Compared to in Trinidad, it's, it's a result. And in Trinidad, it's always the result and it's somebody else's fault and here, you he, he, being put under different pressure to try and achieve things, to, to make sure you keep your level of performances. And that was probably the biggest challenge. But in terms of what the club had to offer, what the place was like, what the experience was like, it was, it was incredible. And it's an eye open. And I would always say that I would wish it on any other Trinidad and Tobago football to be able to get the experience. And now we're all not going to be fortunate to get it, but it's, it's, fast, it's, it's fantastic. And it's something that I think that you just got to try and embrace, but it's great if you can have the experience of somebody behind you trying to tell you about what to expect and where the challenges are going to come towards you. And I mean, our challenges was only small compared to somebody like Dwight who's playing for Aston Villa and playing for Manchester United. So, I mean, the credit that you can give to people like Dwight and Shaka and, and Russell and Stone and them for what they've achieved, it's incredible. And what they've done for Trinidad and Tobago football, and you, you, you can't give them more than credit for what they've done. Um, well, for me, the, um, one of the first challenges was obviously um, I've been to, when I went to Scotland, they didn't have much black people there, one. Um, the one of the person who was there, well, some of the players who were there before me, um, Tony Roger, he played for Red Rovers, um, Arnold Dorica, um, Craig Demon, and I think Craig Demon's brother, they were at a team called East Five, which is you know, in the local area where, where I, st I stay at this present time. But one of the, the biggest challenges as well, as I said, the weather. You know, it's, it's cold, um, you're not used to it, and you, you're watching these guys and them, you know, running about in it like it's, it's not a problem, you know. And, you know, for me, it took me a year to actually settle. I was homesick for a year, knowing, you know, missing Trinidad and Tobago, you're always inside when you, you finish training, it's back inside because it's not that you can go on the block and hang out with your friends and stuff, you know, it's completely different. And just as you know, Dennis said, I taught Trinidad and Tobago love football. But it's until I went to Scotland, you see people who really love football. They are passionate, just as Dennis said, the fans are passionate. If, you, if you, you give them opportunity, they can kill you for the club because they, 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 that is their life. Every Saturday, they're coming to watch you, they're coming to support you. Don't matter how far the game is, they are there. And just as Dennis said, you are constantly under pressure. Why? Because every game you play, you get a statistic on the Monday morning. Either in the Sun newspaper, which is one of the <laughs> one of the most hated newspapers, I think, in, in, in the UK, that where they will grade you and tell you either you get a five out of ten, a six out of ten, a two out of ten, and they tell you how you play. Then just as Dennis says, as a young man, when you read that, and then obviously you have fans who probably wasn't happy with your performance. There's an added pressure. 
And these are the things that help develop us into the, the players that we, we became, that it was even more beneficial for Trinidad and Tobago when it came to the crucial time. And this, is, this was a, a learning curve for us that, you know, you, you, you're fighting against the weather, you're fighting against racism, you're fighting against um, different things. And the same as Dennis said, that when I went to Scotland, I was welcome in open arms as well. They made me feel at home. The people were so friendly. They looked after me. The fans were, you know, were so good to me at, you know, at the same time. But there were challenges along the way. And you know, it's not easy you know, to go into a foreign country and, and become, become you know, what, what we have achieved. It's, it, it's not an easy thing because you're, you're in a foreign country. You're not, you're not in your home. You're speaking a different language. You can't understand some of the things the boys are saying. They can't understand, they can't understand you. <laughs> you know, it's, the food is different. You know, the, the things that they eat is different. So there are loads of different, different challenges. But I, I believe it was all a blessing to us in disguise. And as I said, by the grace of God, you know, it helped develop us and make us, you know, better players and help us to, to benefit Trinidad and Tobago. At the right. end. Yeah. <laughs> Viewers, we'll be right back after a short break. <laughs> Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited offers solutions to your immediate and future potential problem areas by providing you with a qualified team of safety consultants. Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited, building a reputation on quality and value since 1999. Located 23 Todd Street, San Fernando, Trinidad. Phone 868-657-1534 or 868-788-6955. Worldwide Safety at Yahoo.com. Um, we have the great, the ever popular Russell Atapi. Russell, welcome to the set, bud. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me. Um, again, uh, there were a lot of times in my life uh, that. Uh, give me the belief and the strength to move forward because um, a, a lot of kids look at you and they think that you know everything came easy you know but but in life like in football you get a, a lot of knockbacks and and you need to keep moving on and I think the, the strike squad um, that was a time that gave me the confidence and the belief to know that I can do anything that I wanted to do in football and go as far as I wanted to go because, you know, a bunch of locally based uh, coaches and players were able to reach within touching distance of, uh, of the greatest football show on earth, you know, and, and we competing with, uh, you know, and people talk about uh, America, they now started playing football, but they are superpower as well in, in whatever they do because whatever they put their mind to, they, they invest in it and, and they study it and they do the best that they can. And then again, we compete in with, with Mexico at the time and, you know, and, and people tend to forget that uh, Mexico have a population of 100 million and if we just talk of, of sheer numbers, you know, mm -hmm. young boys who are playing football right. <laughs> with, with that size of population is, is more than our entire population, you know. So we compete in um, with, uh, with, 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 with really good teams and, and, and being able to do what, what Gali and the strike squad did, you know, uh, and the togetherness in the team and the players, it gave you a lot of belief in, in knowing that whatever you wanted to achieve, if you put your mind to it, you can. Right. Um, I, th I thought in strike squad days you had you guys had a lot of pressure on it. You guys were pretty young, a young yeah, group. You, young Dwight, and, and yeah, Dwight, and, and uh, Marvin. You know, we were teenagers, seventeen, yeah. eighteen, somewhere around there at the time. You know, but we were fortunate because we had people there like uh, um, we had Michael Maurice, we had uh, Clayton Morris, we had Brian Williams. You know. Um, experienced players, Hudson Charles, um, you know, experienced players who were there to always look after you and guide you the right way. And um, and I, I suppose these experiences and, and interacting and living with these players kind of uh, dictates the way that uh, 
your personality is shaped. And Gary was a young coach as well. He um, just finished with us, and he come up and he got this this gig mm -hmm. to, to coach a national team. Yeah. And and he said, and he on this show and other things, he said he was trying to emulate the our the, team, the team and yeah. bring this player and bring this player because mm -hmm. that's he didn't have the experience. So he, mm -hmm. He did what he had to do, and yeah. you but, guys but, made but, the country proud, man. Yeah, but 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 I think what what Gali also did in, in my mind is that he, um, he 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 identified and I suppose developed or tried to develop a brand, which is which is our way, the way that we play, you know, um, and, and and I think that is underestimated because. A lot of times, for example, we look at the games on TV and we see Germany play, you know, and and yeah, we try to emulate true. things that the Germans do. Right. It's just impossible. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, yeah. we build differently, we, build, we think build differently, yeah. um, our culture is different, different yeah. you know. So it's impossible. I think what Gali did is he was able to see um, and understand our culture, the way we live, uh, the way we think. Uh, the way we rest, the way we eat, and he was, he was able to take all of that and find the best possible way for us to play football. And he even tried to give it a name, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. ice soccer or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And and I and I still think um, uh, that is that is the way to go. And even he's he even one who, you guys is the one who start naming the, the team with a name. Our team never had a name. You had Strike Squad, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you guys got an identity. Yeah. You had songs like yeah. when yeah. I came, I was living abroad. I came to train at Latas Dance, yeah. Dance or something like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? You had all yeah, that yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. Yeah. A lot and, of brand. And, and I think the the other thing with Gali as well, you know, he designed the, the top that we use as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so straight away when anybody see the top, they they were able to identify themselves or whoever it was with yeah, uh, think it is this the... particular project. It is one of the replicas or the T-shirts that it's most recognized, you know. Wow. Once you see it, everyone knows right away, you know, it is the Strike Squad era. Yeah. So okay, so this um, this is done. This, um, we, we, we... You're on the national we team. We had really. a, yeah. a foot in the door and mm -hmm. we stepped out. Now, yeah. now it's after that game. Yeah. What's your condition mind-wise? Um, and where did you go from there? Yeah, what happens there is that... Uh, so much of your energy and, 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 and your hopes, aspirations are, are into qualifying. And, and when you don't, you know, it's, it's a big knock, you know, you're taking right. a big knock there. So um, we regrouped um, and I fortunately got the opportunity to go to Portugal and, um, and try to play professionally. So um, I went to Portugal, uh, a football agent took me. Uh, and the first club he took me to was Porto. Um, now, back in the day, um, you were only allowed to have three foreign players. Um, and uh, going to a club like Porto, we had players who were playing there like, uh, like Branco, uh, okay, you nice know, the, yeah. the Brazilian left yeah. back. We had right. Geraldo, we had Maje. There was a lot of uh, top international players, yes. Yeah, so. It was hard to get in the door, especially coming from a nation that nobody really knows in the know. football world, you know. <laughs> and when you go from Trinidad, where's that? In Africa. Africa. That's <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so you had to fight your way in. And um, so uh, eventually the coach sent me to Porto's farming team, a team called Gil Vicente. Um, but uh, knowing football agents working all the time, uh, my agent was, was able to get me a better deal at the time with another club called Academica. So I went to Academica and I had three or four wonderful years at Academica. And just, um, I was fortunate again in, in, in my football career to get wonderful coaches. Coaches who allowed me to go and express myself. Right. So, um, so with Academica, for example, um, the coach kind of built a structure around the way I played. Right. So, uh, tactically, I this didn't really team. have any responsibilities. Yeah. My responsibility was to get the ball and make things happen offensively. Right. Um, 
so in doing that, I was enjoying myself. That was like playing back room in the mm. yard, yeah, you right, know, right. getting the ball and having fun. And um, and not knowing to me, Porto, the eyes were always on me all the same. And uh, three or four seasons after, um, they came back to Academica and, um, and they got me. Um, that time, uh, Bobby Robson, did you see? Sir Bobby Robson was the... Uh, was the coach at Porto and, um, and Jose Mourinho mm -hmm. was uh, was working with him there at the time. So I went to Porto and uh, and I spent two years there. And I think that is when uh, the tactical aspect of my game really developed because um, playing with Academica, you're playing just in the domestic league, and you know uh, you know that uh, you're not going to get demoted and you're going to try to win the league. So you're just going and playing football. But when uh, when I went to Porto now and we play in uh, Champions League and UEFA competitions, then if if you really want to get a game on the team, the tactical side of your yeah, game to needs to be to right. be up to scratch as well, you know, because yeah. I, if you go away and you play to Inter or Sampdoria or or Nantes as, as I did back in the day, um, then you can't only attack; you have to defend, of you know. Course. Yes, and um, and. And, yeah, and, and that was when my knowledge of the game, uh, especially the tactical aspect, really developed. So. Right. So um, I know that um, Rangers and Celtics mm -hmm. had competition. I also saw, I think you scored a goal when you, Rangers beat Celtics 2-1. I can't remember that game. But I, we're going to take a break now. But when we come back, I want you to tell us a little bit about that rivalry because it's like Manchester United Arsenal or something, you know? Uh, and so on and so on, we talk a little bit about that. We'll be right back after the show. Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited offers solutions to your immediate and future potential problem areas by providing you with a qualified team of safety consultants. Worldwide Safety Consultants Limited building a reputation on quality and value since 1999. Located 23 Todd Street, San Fernando, Trinidad. Phone 868-657-1534 or 868-788-6955. Worldwide Safety at Yahoo.com. Thank you, ACTN, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in every Monday night at 8 p.m. We do repeat on a Tuesday at 1. So if you're missing a Monday night, don't forget you can check us out on a Tuesday. And we have a Facebook page. Check us out. We do have an email address, feelofdreamstt at gmail.com. You can drop us a line. The show is ended. Go in peace. My name is Steve David. Good night.